Texas Theater. Four days in Dallas with Oliver Stone, born on the 4th of July. So we're on the fourth day. Now showing Tom Cruise. See which one is the Oswald seat. See if we can find it. It's somewhere around here. Five seats in on this. One, one, three, four, one, three, four. Like right there, and then he went back over here, right? Yeah, we went moved back there, so we sat there twice, moved over, and moved back. Okay. This is again just kind of the general zip code. Everything's been pretty, pretty moved around. Buddy, how's it going? So in 15 years I've been trying to make this happen. Thank you guys so much to those of you that have been uh, to all four screenings. It's been a special treat to have all of our town. So uh, he's not going to be here for the end of the film because he has to catch a flight. So uh, Matt is going to talk to him right now. If I can get a hold of Matt. Matt, right there. Hold on one second. He's getting instructions. All right, here he is. Matt's on our side to put this whole thing together. Let's get it done. And uh, sorry, I got distracted backstage by talking to Oliver Stone, which kind of is a thing that happens a lot. Yeah, here he is. here for it. Uh, and I wanted to start by talking to you about, just for the benefit of anybody who doesn't know the story, the, the genesis of this. Like, ha, ha, you wanted to make it before, it didn't work out. Just kind of briefly give us the history of, and then how it finally happened. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, it was first introduced, the book was introduced in 1976. It had a wonderful uh, front page review in the book review of the time, New York Times, which got a lot of attention in those days. And it was optioned by Marty Bregman, who was a producer of Al Pacino films. Uh, he, was one, he was known as. I worked with him on Platoon. He couldn't make it. Uh, I, I was a screenwriter. He optioned that, couldn't make it. As you know, 10 years later, I was able to make it <laughs> as a director, writer. And the same thing is true about Born on the Fourth of July, because I went to work very, very difficult uh, novel because a uh, uh, book, rather memoir, because it was uh, it was back and forth through time, and people. There had been another screenplay was it didn't work. Uh, I came in. And I spent a lot of time with Ron. Uh, lived it with him. Took went to see these places in, in in Long Island, and I knew about Vietnam, and he constructed for me uh, the. The skeleton of this thing, and we put flesh on it, and, and as you, it was a beautiful script. It was up, and then they were going to make it with Pacino, actually, in 1978, uh, with uh, Billy Friedkin as a director. Everybody, everything was in place, and problems developed with the financing, and uh, it fell apart. Uh, it was a very uh, sobering experience for both myself and for Ron Kovic because, you know, we, we were three weeks from shooting. It was all set up. Every, all that work had been done. The rehearsing was going on. And I saw a beautiful movie before my eyes in a rehearsal hall. So it was quite disappointing. Uh, we recovered. You know, we moved on. I told Ron I'd come back if I ever had an opportunity and I'd make this with him because I was angry. I didn't know, I didn't really think I'd ever get this opportunity again. In fact, I never thought they would make more Vietnam movies after uh, Apocalypse and Deer Hunter and Coming Home. I thought, you know, now they're into the Rambo and, and uh, Chuck Norris stuff. They're gonna make it as just an action backdrop like an old Western, you know, they're gonna keep making them like that. I didn't think there'd be any attempt to do a platoon or a point of the fourth, which shows you what a turnaround the 80s was uh, 
And frankly, if you remember, those who were film buffs would remember that when Stanley Kubrick announced that he was going to make a Full Metal Jacket in 19, which was delayed again. But Full Metal Jacket was his Vietnam movie, which is a really good movie. And it was announced, but he was always in so people got more interested. The commercial pulse went up. Maybe it's not such a bad idea. And uh, in uh, after the success, well, Platoon really set this up. The success of that movie was phenomenal. It was unexpected. They had turned it down so many times. And when the film went through the roof in this country, it was the number four film of the year in terms of box office volume and around the world above all, because this is, you know, it's an American subject matter, but they really had a huge response internationally. So uh, that led to this moment in time where I could pretty much do what I want. <laughs> and after Wall Street's success, I, uh, I came to Dallas to, and, uh, to, with the intention of doing Born on the Fourth of July, which matched Massachusetts' 1940s and 50s. Massapequa. I'm sorry, Massapequa, Massapequa, Long Island, which is a suburban town that was developed in the 1940s, 50s. Uh, we found what we needed here in Dallas. We liked the open skies. I did, especially for some reason. I loved the idea of going to Texas. Texas was very friendly, very warming. They had a, a, a nascent film board, new people, and uh, you know they were. They wanted the business to come to Texas. They wanted to make movies here. And nothing was being done, right? Very little before 1986. I don't Occasional, but nothing like what you did with a series of films. So uh, the, the also important was that we, we were squeezed on the budget. It was a very tough film with, even with Tom Cruise, the commercial uh, red line was, was, uh, was, was lower than the average film with Tom Cruise, way lower. So we had to squeeze this budget, and we couldn't do it in California. It was impossible, or in Long Island or New York State. So it's, this was a right-to-work state. Uh, that's to say we could use people as we wanted to. We didn't, we're not bound by the Hollywood regulations. That saves a lot of money. And the people were very kind. There was a huge, extras, a huge pool of people who were willing to be extras. And uh, we developed that pool over those that film. Prior to making, uh, prior to making uh, Born on the Fourth of July, I, I came here to, and was, because of a delay in Cruz's schedule, I had to wait for 10 months for him, so I shot talk radio instead, which is a... What are your thoughts about uh, Tom Cruise and the Top Gun phenomenon, which, which made him, Top Gun made him one of the biggest, one of the biggest stars in the world, he still is, incredibly. Uh, that was the same then, year. And, and then, uh, you know, then three years, yeah, right, that same year as Platoon, right, that was wild. And then three years later, you make Born on the Fourth of July, the message of which I would say is about as close to diametrically opposite as you can get. <laughs> right? And, 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 you know, just... Oh, to the, Tom, you mean? Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, there's implications oh, yeah. of casting Tom Cruise in this, and I wondered well, if we could talk about remember, it. Remember, your impression of Tom Cruise is based on now. You have to remember, this was 19... 88, 9. And he was still uh, relatively, he was a high young item, no question. Uh, he had, I think, Risky Business was the biggest hit he had. He had a few, yeah. Not a few. <laughs> and Rain Man hadn't come out. Rain Man had not come out, and that's what we were waiting for. So he was not as hot as he became. But he was uh, an exciting young actor, and he, was, he worked like a dog, uh, like a dog covid to learn all the moves to feel out the the, the paraplegic experience uh, and uh, I found him to develop I found him developing during the film from really being a young man a, a young man to being a more of a middle-aged man more of a man who is uh, responsible for who understood life better so that uh, it was it was a pleasure to work with him. It was demanding. We shot here, and we shot, and then we moved over to the Philippines. The, the Texas shoot went smoothly. We did parades here, up and down, two parades up and down Edgecliff. So, Edge, Ed, yeah, I was just there looking at the old 
And they told me that's where you shot the, 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 the parade. I said, what are you talking about? It doesn't look at all like it. <laughs> it was a bunch of low level, it looked like a dump. I mean, I'm not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have chosen it, but it turned out. We they didn't have your production designer. That's we had a production designer. We built up the, the place to look like a more prosperous town. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit about the, sh the actual physical filming of the movie? Because you have a, uh, there's a number of things that are, I would say, unique to your filmography. One of them is, this is your first CinemaScope film. And also, your protagonist is down at the, roughly three feet level. And, and, you're, and you're using a steady cam, and the camera, as I understand it, was quite large. And there's a lot of things you had to take into account, right? Yeah, we, we decided to shoot this 235. Now, a lot of people would go for an interior film with claustrophobia. I had just done that with talk radio. That's why I worked, I, I developed as a filmmaker doing talk radio. If you see it, you'll understand. Technically, it's very tight in studio, mostly in studio, with a lot of trick shots. and. Uh, I wanted to, we wanted to open it up, use the skies, use the bigness, make it an American saga. And uh, I think we achieved our purpose here. It felt like a big movie. Even though he would be, in, for two thirds of the movie, the first third he would be himself as a young, younger boy, 17, 18. And uh, this, the last two thirds would be in this wheelchair, as, as Matt says, uh, three feet maybe. Everything had to be seen at that point through his eyes as much as possible. So he comes home. The house was very tight, the, the real house too. So we, 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 the dimensions of the interior of the, of the studio, we, we built it a studio here, or we did it, I think we did it, where did we do it? I forgot. The, stu oh, the studio, wasn't it? What, didn't you? I don't know. Didn't you shoot it at Las Colinas or did you did shoot we? it somewhere else? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> But I can find out. Um, anyway, the house. Yeah, because we had to. The house was really. They didn't. They built houses in the 40s and the 50s that were tighter, narrower, smaller than the ones they they building out now. Now you get these. You get mansions practically. So the housing itself was was tighter, more restricted. So shooting inside these small corridors, hallways was really challenging. But we did it, and we, not only that, we took the camera, because we'd worked together, Bob Richardson and I, for th four films now, three films, we, we took the camera off, uh, off the tripods, and we just went to work with swinging wild and free as we could with this CinemaScope camera. Which, uh, so you see the world in a big way from his point of view. So you have, you have this, this incident that triggers pretty much everything that happens to Ron Cody right. throughout the rest of the story, which is a friendly fire incident, which is covered up. This is all part of the historical record. And uh, I, you deal with the military process, the, the military mentality when it comes to these types of accidents in this movie in a very, very uh, blunt, kind of horrifying way. And I wonder if you could talk about that and relate it to your own experience in Vietnam. Well, it was blunt and horrifying. Uh, you know, and it was also, interspersed with moments of great beauty. Vietnam was a beautiful country. Uh, Ron, in fact, was going back on his second tour. People don't remember that, but he had completed his first tour as a Marine, and he went back as a second tour. And uh, it was then on his second tour that he was wounded. Uh, and he had the, uh, in a sense, the magic wound because he was shot in the heel, and uh, he remembers that moment the rest of his life. He was shot in the heel, uh, and uh, he kept trying to be, uh, he pictured himself as a hero, and he thought it was doing his duty to get back in there, and he couldn't, he couldn't move, it was, it was, his Achilles had been torn out, so I guess when he stood up, that's exactly the same moment, when you'll see this in the film, that's the exact same moment that he was shot in the, uh, above the lung, uh, above the lung here, but, uh, about here, and uh, paralyzed forever. That was a tough one for him, very tough for anybody. Uh, and you'll see what happens. Uh, the, the point is that he, you can say that he, unless he, that had happened to him, I don't, would he have turned against the war like he did? And I would say to you, I don't know. You know, frankly, I don't know the answer to that. 
because a lot of them came back. And you'll see that scene too. It's the fracture in the country, the parade scene, when you have the, the second parade scene, when you see the, the American Legion commander. Uh, right, commanders. and there's World War II veterans in there who are really not happy about this guy. That's right, and a lot. And there was a tremendous outpour. You know, when Ron's book came out, there was so much, and the, the movie, there was so much denial. He, they always said publicly, the, the Marines and uh, the, the people against the film, that he was, that he somehow made this up about friendly fire. Well, I have to tell you, my own experience was there was a more friendly fire in there than people would know and would admit to because it was asymmetrical warfare in a jungle or on a beach or whatever. You couldn't see the enemy most of the time. And so often, we would, uh, our, our casualties were from friendly fire, which indicated our own men in the shooting in crossfires or shooting without seeing what they were shooting at or the bush itself or else artillery that was called in wrongly or else uh, bombing from planes. It was uh, very dangerous and I think that's true in any war. I really do and I think there's far more of it than the Pentagon wants to admit because they don't want the parents to feel that their son or was killed in the, in a, in a, in a, in a, by his own son which happens. One of the things that uh, was uh, remarkable and was widely discussed about Platoon was that it was a 360 degree war movie. That you largely did away with the, with the, the technique in most Hollywood war films of this army's on this side of the screen, that army's on that side of the screen. You didn't do that. You never knew where the threat was coming from. You broke the axis a lot. And, and I feel like in Born on the Fourth of July, you evolved that a bit. And I wondered if you could talk about that, that uh, creating that subjective experience of not knowing where the enemy is, not knowing what you're looking at. The battlefield. Yeah. Well, it was a little bit different uh, problems for me tactically because it was a beach, more open visibility. But still, no matter what, the c combat goes at a certain, like, like pro football, it goes at a faster speed than you ever think. And there's a lot of miscommunication over radios. You hear a lot of garbled radio talk on, in, in these two films. Uh, it's important to realize that's so confusing. Uh, and then, it, you know, even then it comes from the lieutenant, gets to the uh, platoon sergeant, maybe. He gets it, but then he still has to get the word out to the people in his uh, squad. So there's a squad sergeant, too. We didn't have radios for a squad sergeant, but still, sometimes, I'm saying the communication level is very primitive. At this, uh, in, that, in that kind of a situation. I suppose now you, they'd have uh, mics wired to each man with a, uh, to their mouths. They'd be kind of professional uh, walking robot kind of computer soldiers. <laughs> the, uh, the VA hospital sequence in this movie is, is uh, I don't know that it's ever been matched in terms of its intensity. Well, that comes from Ron's book, and that, you know, that was very accurate. I tried to be as accurate as possible to what he was saying. It was such a horrible experience. It was the Bronx VA, which was busted as one of the worst of those hospitals, because for some reason, it, although so much money was spent on the war, <laughs> they didn't somehow get down to the hospital level. And a lot of people, some people had, were in better places, and some people were in worse, but the Bronx was a bad place. And, I didn't exaggerate. I really tried to stick to it. Uh, it was so dramatic what he was telling me. And you'll see the result, which is, I think, one of the highlights of the film. I, I we shot that in that old hospital. It's gone now on the, near the Stonely Hotel. I, I, uh, well, you and I have talked about this, but I wanted you to talk about it with the audience here. This, I, I was curious when I went in to start talking to you for the book about your career and life why you have not told your own story of returning home as a veteran, having made two very successful films about Vietnam. It seems like a story you could have told. Why didn't you tell your story? Well, because my story is, is, is not generic enough. It's, it's you know, I, I come from a very strange heritage background from New York City, so I didn't, didn't really feel that addressed the American bigger, larger public. I, I thought Ron's book was more more to that effect, more from the, the class he came from and that experience. So many people did come back wounded from that war. 
as you know from our trip, the past wars in Afghanistan and Iran, Iraq, uh, a lot of lower body injuries, a lot of lower body injuries. We didn't have the evacuation uh, procedures as quickly done in Vietnam, so uh, a lot of wounds were, were led to death. But uh, now they're evacuating everybody as much as possible. It's very hard to kill somebody because they just stay on the edge of life and they get they get them back. So the the methods of are much better, but at the same time they're cruel too because when you come to and you don't have your lower body, it's no, it's, it's 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 a choice, you know. And a lot of the veterans, unfortunately, committed suicide. So Ron, and he's still going at the age of 80, of 70, 78. He's still going, and I saw him recently, and he's upbeat, <laughs> he's energetic. And as far as I can tell, he's the same man that made this movie. What are some of the elements, the basic elements of Ron's story that resonate with your own? Like when you're watching the movie, are there scenes in the movie where you think to yourself, yes, this is what I went through too, in some way? Well, I don't know what you're driving at, Matt, because uh, it's, it's, a, it's a general experience. I mean, people will say that I recognize this, this, this. Everybody had their own little experience. They go to a, depends on what unit you're in, whether uh, a lot of that depends what territory you're in. Did you struggle with PTSD in the way that Ron did? I, they, I did, we didn't know it as that. It wasn't. I right now everybody registers for victimhood, but I, I we didn't feel I didn't feel like a victim. Uh, I've been wounded twice and I'd gotten the bronze storm, and I was you know I'd done my duty and I was really, but I realized it was worthless. I mean in terms of that we weren't winning this war. Everyone realized that after March of '68. We were over there, we then Martin Luther King got killed, and then Kennedy, Robert Kennedy got killed. So it was felt like we were just going around in circles, because we'd go up, we'd go to a jungle area or a, a, a beach area, and we'd come back out after a few days, and then we'd be reinserted two weeks later for some reason. So we didn't, we, we were always just, <laughs> we, there was no sense of territory or ground. It was prismatic, you know, you just, wherever you are, have veterans talked to you to any degree about born on the 4th of July? And if so, what, what do they say about it? No, a lot of veterans probably didn't see it because it was a tough film for, it was a tough film to make for an audience. You realize we did very well, very well. It's, I mean, you realize how many teenagers were turned off by, by what happens to, to Cruz? He, he, he's not his, you'll see, you'll see. But uh, it's a tough film. It remained true to the ethic that I felt with working with Ron. So as it happens, uh, we have in the audience tonight, I just met him before the show, uh, a, young, a man named Michael Compertero. I hope I got that right. Uh, are, where are you? Can you raise your hand? Yeah, and he played, he played Private Wilson Hello. in this movie. <laughs> The, who, who kind of launches the entire amazing saga of Ron Kovic forward, and uh, he just wanted, I just wanted to know that, I wanted you to know that he was there. Well, he's a link to the past. Uh, you were a young man, right? You were about 19, 20? Yeah. So you're, you're, you're still, what, 50 something? Yeah. What? You look, well, you look great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Oliver, is there is there anything in this movie that you feel had an impact that changed the way people thought about Vietnam, about the experience of people who were wounded? Uh, and or is there anything that you I don't are not know, happy about? I don't know, man. I really don't know the answer to that. You know, I was hopeful after we, and there was a tremendous letdown from that war for the American nation. I thought it was very much evident in uh, the reaction to the military at that point in the country. And Jimmy Carter, uh, but, but when 1980 happened and Ronald Reagan put his back on a path of upbeat optimism, but that optimism came with military, uh, military, you have to show your military in a situation like that 
at least he felt so, to, to, to uh, dominate the world. And we went into Granada, and that was a very celebrated, although it was a disaster in terms of tactics and strategy. Uh, I mean, they made a movie, Clint, Clint, even Clint Eastwood made a movie uh, uh, sh uh, showing them as heroes. It, it was just yeah. inconceivable if you really think about the reality. And then we went into uh, 1989, right after this movie came out, we attacked Panama. Panama, that was pretty, uh, that was pretty devastating. In other words, we were back in action. We were going directly into Central America with an intervention, and it was a bloody one. A lot of civilians got killed. Uh, chasing, now we we're, were chasing drug lords. Okay, we were chasing Viet Cong in, in, uh, in uh, Vietnam, but yeah, we we're always chasing something. We're chasing our tail off. Uh, so, and then boom, 1991. We get to the biggest, we invade the Middle East. We send like 500,000 troops to the Middle East. So we're back to the Vietnam experience again. That's what I'm saying. We don't know. I, it didn't have the impact on the leaders anyway, the leaders who make these decisions, whether the audience feels that way. It takes time to wind its way through the voting process, so to speak. And when the war doesn't work, as they usually don't work in our, if you look at all the wars we've been in, they usually don't work. It takes a while to get it registered back home. But first of all, we have to lose. So they decided early on that we're not gonna take more casualties. We're gonna send proxy armies to fight for us. You know, and we use proxies as much as possible. So I can't tell you uh, it had any impact at all. I'd like to believe it did. Anyway, uh, I did the best I could with the Vietnam experience. I did three movies about it, and you know, you can't insist. <laughs> when, uh, is, how many people here have seen this movie before? Oh my goodness, a lot of repeat viewers, okay. For the people who haven't seen it yet, if you could tell them anything that would sort of help frame the experience for them, what would you say? I think it was a very distinctive movie for me. It was a, I was learning on every movie and working, getting better at my craft. Uh, I'd always been, uh, as a writer and as a director. So by the time I made, this is my fourth, fifth movie, I was feeling very confident after this movie that I could handle more and bigger subjects. This was a big subject. This is deals with America before the war, after the war, during the war. So it was quite, a, uh, quite, a step up from the previous movies I did, which was a little bit more confined. So each movie was getting bigger, and after this one I took on The Doors, which I felt confident about, because it was also an era of music, things I don't normally do. And, and right after that I took on the, probably the largest, most ambitious subject I ever did, which was the JFK assassination, uh, which I also did part of down here. So that was a big thing for me, and I and I was very proud. Ron was, it made his life. I I, I wish that uh, Tom Cruise had gotten an Oscar because it really he told me recently that yeah. he really thinks it was uh, a special event and it marked his life deeply. And to this day, he still uh, he sends uh, on the Fourth of July he makes sure he sends roses to Ron. And all that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. So uh, Oliver is going to stay for part of the movie. He has to get back to his regular life, the regular life of Oliver Stone. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he's going to watch as much of it as he can before he has to go to the airport. And then afterwards, I'm going to do a brief interview with Michael, AKA Private Wilson, because I'm interested in this thing from his perspective. So if you want to stick around for that, I'll be brief, but it should be fun. Uh, and thank you so much for coming out to all of these movies and the series. It's been an extraordinary weekend, and Oliver, you've been extraordinary. Thank you. Just one word of caution. Bear in mind, this is a 2K uh, print. It's, uh, yeah, I've since, it was done in 2012. We did the best we could, but it's a little, in my mind, it was a little dark. I don't even know if I did it, but uh, the 4K, what we did in, which will come out eventually, this year somewhere. With a commentary track by me. Interesting. So what are the odds, right? Yeah, by me. Yes.
Well, it's, it's, I think you're going to enjoy it, Oliver. It's my fourth pass at writing about this film. I'm just going to keep writing about this film once every 10 years until I'm dead. And then maybe beyond. Thank, thank you, man, for all the kindness and the hospitality you've shown me. Oh, thank you, Oliver.